Welcome back to Schoolhouse Cracked. As always, be sure to like us on Facebook, download us on all your favorite podcast channels, subscribe to us on YouTube, and send us your thoughts and opinions at schoolhousecracked at gmail.com. With me, as always, is Mr. Brett Derrickson, advocate uh, for all learners, um, advocate for all educators, and good friend. Yeah, and absolutely. Again, here, my uh, close friend and my, my partner, Dr. Uh, Marcus Motor Chandler, and I just want to thank you for, for being academic for being a practical leader and for putting your uh, hands and, and feet to the ground on all the things that we've done. Some of the things our listeners don't know is, is that we, uh, we're not just in front of cameras. We've done a lot of projects together that get us in front of the community and, and you've taken the lead on that. I wanna speak to your practical experiences as yeah. far as your, being a Dr. Motor Chandler. Thanks, Brett. Yeah, man. Um, so today we're gonna tackle uh, an issue and we've actually, Brett and I have talked about this at length um, and this is something we've decided to dedicate as an ongoing series. Um, so something that's going to come up as an episode um, over the course of, of our next couple seasons um, and that's been through audience feedback, things we're seeing in, in media, social media, um, and the common dialogue in, in American society right now and that's uh, what, what has been phrased as um, in a variety of ways diversity, equity, and inclusion um, depending on uh, what modality you're working from sometimes diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging um, but we're going to be devoting episodes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Marcus, why don't you just go ahead and frame that for us. When, when you're speaking with folks in the academic setting as, as you're getting uh, people ready for counseling and, and for leadership uh, to the university, what is diversity, equity, and inclusion really, and what does, what would it mean uh, to to our audience, people who are interested in public schooling? Sure. So, uh, I guess before I I define those, I'll preface it with saying like I am very aware that I'm a middle aged balding white man, mm -hmm. and I teach classes on diversity, equity, and inclusion, <laughs> yeah. um, and, and so there's uh, sometimes that's seen as a bit uh, dichotomous, or mm -hmm. or sometimes maybe uh, a bit hypocritical, mm -hmm. um, depending on on how you look mm -hmm. at it, but. Um, it's something I firmly believed in uh, as an educator, and I still believe in as an educator of soon-to-be um, uh, uh, counselors, educators, leaders. Um, so, but I, it's funny you say that because today, Brett, I, um, I, I teach a diversity, equity, and inclusion leadership class to um, senior NCOs uh, with um, a, a local military academy, with the United States Air Force Academy. And we, we start at, and where we're at today within the units is defining diversity, equity, and inclusion. So diversity... Um, you know, is generally defined as uh, some of those protected statuses that fall under federal law. Um, so things like uh, race, ethnicity, um, uh, uh, religion, um, uh, you know, uh, some other times, depending on your university or organization, um, you define diversity as maybe weight and age, mm -hmm. um, sexual orientation, gender identity. And so obviously that's not an all-inclusive list. Like we're, we're beginning to understand diversity as um, people with differing backgrounds, perspectives, experiences, and that definition is kind of expanding as we start to understand and appreciate differences in one another. Can I just add to that? You use the term uh, uh, NCOs, and that means non-commissioned officers. What that yeah, means thank you, thank you, thank is you. that uh, Dr. Motor Chandler is working with the United States Air Force Academy on helping uh, their leaders become better leaders uh, of the military, not of course in accordance with military strategy, but in, a, in accordance with leading men and women um, in, in one of our largest institutions. What we can speak to having worked in school, not only grown up in the, in the area that we have with Absolutely. as many military uh, bases as military linked families, but in the, in the public school district with the greatest number of, of military uh, related children, probably in the entire uh, country, it's really important to understand the United States military is an extraordinarily diverse place. Highly diverse. For it's considered all, yeah. it's considered one of the most highly diverse public employers if yeah. you consider the federal government a public employer, yeah. military a public yeah. employer. Yeah, and one so of the most highly diverse employers. Yeah, so these 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 folks that are uh, becoming officers and and whatever your image is of of people who are officers in in the military, there is again one of those challenges that our officers in all of those ways that you spoke about diversity, whether it's gender or race or sexual orientation or religion or any number of things, our officers do tend to fit that kind of traditional hierarchy that has gone, uh, has been a part of our country for a long time, though those who enlist and those who they command are the most diverse. So what we're talking about is a significant 
uh, issue for them. And, and so I, I do need to clarify, though, I'm not an employee of the United States Air Force Academy. Yeah. I, I work for a different institute of higher education. We're in partnership with yeah. them. There are similar partnerships with um, the West Point uh, and Columbia, for example, mm -hmm. um, Annapolis and, and another university near them. So, um, But it, it, going on to define these things, um, equity, you know, we're defining equity as um, the ways in which we identify these differences and when they're used to either discriminate, discriminate oppress, um, or marginalize a group and try to address that challenge to bring equitable uh, environments to everybody that's engaging um, in, in that situation. So uh, understanding that there are differences and, and making a commitment to challenge when those uh, distinctions and those differences are used from a position of power to marginalize another group. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then finally, inclusion. Um, you know, how uh, generally we're just going to define that as how an individual um, feels about being part of the group with those other two items we just discussed being taken into account. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Very real issues. Again, you know, like kind of my story from the trenches is, is, is twofold, uh, and you and I have been similar in, in this way. Uh, you know, I get in to public schools in 1999. I am teaching at an urban uh, high school, a school that is a, uh, what did we used to call it, my minority majority, I think was one of the the terms we used to use for the schools that you and yeah, I worked always, at. Yeah, which has always been like uh, something that's rubbed me a little raw. It's yeah, like once yeah. the minority is the majority, it's just the majority. <laughs> yeah. Why do we continue to still call it that? From, from a DEI lens, it is important. Though, yeah. Because it's understanding the marginalization and, and the experiences that that, that that group may experience in the larger society. Right, yeah. Even though the smaller organization, they may be uh, – that. however, we're going to define minority, whether it's religious, mm -hmm. sexual orientation, race, ethnicity. Yeah, and then and the institutional power of, of – of the high school or the school district did not match. I mean, they st minority for me is a is a, a power piece within our society, whether it's it's economic or political or whatever else. And and the the very groups of students that we were talking about in this case, particularly uh, socioeconomic and, and race and ethnicity related, though they were the majority of the of the students, uh, they did not represent within our community any of the significant power structure so yeah, so that that term though was always weird to say i was glad that it we said it and i was glad that it brought me discomfort because i do remember you know when i first got there our electives were um psychology and i can't even remember uh economics was an elective at that time i'm glad it's you know something that students have to take now but but the point is is that we had all of these students and so much opportunity through our academic electives to do something special and i started a course which i've mentioned before on our podcast called ethnic studies study of american minorities and contemporary social problems but going back to what you were saying about being a dei uh, professor or, or teaching a course um, at some point in time, what we felt as, is like you got to fill in the gaps. Mm -hmm. it, am, am I the most qualified person to develop a curriculum for that? Am I the best person to, to teach it? Uh, absolutely not, nor did I ever feel that way. No. But was that better than uh, making... Than not teaching it at all. <laughs> yeah, or to, yeah. You know, not having elective for kids that they connected with. Yeah, ab ab absolutely, Brett. I, I feel the, that same way at times mm -hmm. when I'm speaking about topics... Um, uh, that uh, like like intersectionality, for mm -hmm. example, when I speak about intersectionality, um, you know, I, I if you look at the different roles that one may play in social identity, um, in, in all those social identities, I would be in a position of privilege, obviously, yeah. educated, like my my personal background, um, and, and so then it seems a little uh, hypocritical to talk about those things, but reminding myself that um, it's actually very important that it's still talked about mm -hmm. consistently in all organizations meaningfully and that those concepts are put into action as opposed to either not talking about them at all or just providing them lip service, which we see um, organizationally in a lot of places, whether it's private sector, public schools, you name it. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of places have a DEI initiatives, DEI directors. And so the level at which they uh, make that an important facet of their organization and not just have it as something nice to put on the website it is important. And I think that's the distinction here. Yeah, and, and we have to we we have to talk about it uh, b because we're in a position of power and influence. And the truth of the matter is, is, is Marcus, is that you and I, for the last ten years, always have been. Absolutely, we have we have screened candidates. We have designed interview questions. The very content of the question. We have put together the interview panels we have been the people who have hired and have re recommended we have been in charge of recruiting yeah. and, and we, retainment we are the system yes that either values this or does not value this. right 
Right. So I, I can't do anything at this point in time about my whiteness or, or, or my privilege. But at the very least, if I'm not engaging in these conversations, I can't have critical consciousness. And I don't want by any means to, to pretend that I am at such a high level of, of attunement to others no. that, that I am going to in, uh, interrupt this problem. But at the very, very least, we have diversity, equity, and inclusion as an academic issue. Mm -hmm. We have culturally responsive teaching. We have culturally mm -hmm. responsive curriculum. And we're now getting ourselves into a place now where we can at least sit down at the table and have conversation about whether or not we are being democratic in our institutions and we are looking for equity and opportunity for all our people. Again, that's my little second story from the trenches. We just uh, hired a black woman as a social worker at our school. We're redesigning our uh, counseling team. We used to have a counselor for grade level. Now we have two counselors and a, and a social worker. Uh, we didn't know exactly what we were doing. We just know that mental health issues and educating of the whole child is is premium at this mm -hmm. point in time uh, we didn't go out to hire a black social worker we went out to hire a social worker somebody who's who's whose greatest amount of time was working with the families mm -hmm. not just you know the the kids the and their schedule school. or whatever yeah. the whole point being is that it has been a wonderful addition to our school mm -hmm. that that this woman and all that she is is also a black woman and what that means to our kids i can't they've they're already calling her um instead of by her full name by uh, you know miss in her initial mm. and and uh, creating a, a a person in a relatable person to her and it's it's just been amazing i would like to to do that more for my school sure. and, and so i think you make the distinction brett and so in schoolhouse cracked we're always looking at kind of those cracks that are forming in our public education system and how we can start to address them before they become chasms. And so I think what you're making the distinction here uh, is between um, talking about it and turning it into an actionable item. Yeah. So we're, we're talking about something that your organization clearly values, but what does that look like as an actionable item? Mm -hmm. And so rather than just, uh, in this case, hoping for uh, a diverse applicant pool or um, you know just waiting for the applications to come in and crossing your fingers, like actually going back to an actionable step of proactively recruiting from different communities outside our own, mm -hmm. uh, recruiting from different states, um, looking for places that um, that may not be represented in, in your faculty in the student body. So I think about the example, and I read about this all the time, um, organizations that, that have an aspirational goal of having uh, a diverse workforce, for yeah. example. And, and again, we can define diversity um, as uh, as race, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, geog uh, geographical representation, um, language ability. These are all forms of uh, forms of diversity that an organization may seek. Um, but many of them want this, and then they'll just sit and sit back and wait and hope those applications come in, yeah. as opposed to taking actionable steps. And so, one of the things. I know that happened for some time in your recruiting experiences was you'd go, you'd be sent by your organization on recruiting fairs to predominantly non-diverse universities yeah. and states and communities, um, knowing that there was a goal to do otherwise, to be more representative of the student body, but unintentionally creating a process that just continued the issue. Yeah, I think, I think there's uh, a couple of things that I would like to emphasize. So obviously, there's, there's never, there's no two kinds of people. There's no just two pathways out no, there. No, of course but, not. So, but yeah. just for the sake of, of, of our discussion, I think one is really weak uh, efforts to, um, to get the kinds of people in that are going to connect with our kids. And whether they connect with our kids or not, or whether or not we have the exact demographic representation, just the idea of diverse uh, representation within our faculty, like period, flat out. Uh, uh, as an example, we, we, you know, we do not have a strong Muslim population or a strong Jewish population at the school that I work at. Neither in the school or, or within the, the geographical area of the yeah, school. Yeah, cor correct. Mm -hmm. But um, for me and for my opinion, uh, b being able to bring in somebody of a completely different 
um, uh, cultural background still meets this idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion because it, it, it means that the people that these kids learn to love because they come in every day, work hard for them, and connect with them, what they can learn from the fact that this person you thought you had nothing in common from means that no matter where I go out in the world, I can find you know the universal human condition. I can connect with anybody. If you're only connecting with those that you have like-mindedness with or that you look like or feel like, uh, I don't know that you have the confidence in a global society to be really caring. Or, or truly prepared for the global society. Yeah, I, you know, and that's uh, that's uh, um, even even more important. I think the other one is 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 that we are not doing anything um, beyond uh, the schoolhouse that helps address the institutional issues. I remember when I was in at university, we had a really cool uh, program that it was it was an affirmative action program, but it was it was a, it was very simple. It was a recruitment affirmative action. It wasn't a point system which has been uh, challenged. It was an aspirational goal and not a quota. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. It wasn't quota based what, whatsoever, but we were able at our university to bring in um, a significant number of uh, future or prospective black male, in particular, engineers. And I had a, a, an opportunity just to befriend them through you know faith background. And I, I knew from that moment that we had to have something similar in, in education. One of the problems that was expressed to me by the, my, my friends that I met there was that education can't erase um, the socioeconomic gap that often exists in our minority community. So I can't just say, hey, uh, spring breaks are awesome. Uh, you know what I mean? I have to, we have to have some sort of solutions at, at a level. If we want to, to place in front of our kids truly great role models that they can connect with, people who are opening doors and removing barriers, we're going to have to remove barriers for those future role models. Yeah, for the educators. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you, you hit on kind of two points that from a research standpoint are significant and just in like the vocabulary of, of diversity, equity, and inclusion are significant. Um, the first one, when you talk about bringing in uh, as an administrator into your, um, into your faculty, just diverse backgrounds. And, and again, in, in the case you use diversity mm -hmm. from a faith-based yeah. perspective, maybe. Obviously, um, legally, you're not just going to hire for that as a screening, but if it's something that happens organically through the process, you know, it's, an, it's, a, it's a value added for your, for your diverse faculty. Um, but that is uh, uh, the concept of a, a, a positional perspective taking. Yeah. And so for kids, being able to hear a variety of different perspectives and practice the ability to step into those perspectives and see from a different position kind of different ways uh, of viewing and thinking about and processing the same issue is something that happens at a young age through exposure to other diverse perspectives. And, and again, however you define that, you know, if, if you're in a very affluent school, for example, and, and you have to have a faculty member who grew up in a very low socioeconomic status, all, everything else considered the same, um, that is a different perspective now that student's going to hear. Yeah. Um, and and that, that challenges the way in which they, they internalize a singular message and begin to take those different perspectives and, and, and develop greater empathy, actually. Yeah, and, I'm, and just... As if I, I hope this isn't condescending to you, but just to say it in, in more simple terms. Yeah, was, go for it. That was that was, <laughs> that was the uh, that was the uh, academic, I yeah, guess, yeah. explanation. But it, it comes down, yeah. to, uh, I guess, from a, another tale. A, as you know, I, I grew up grew up a homophobic person, uh, playing uh, sports and coming from uh, the Judeo Christian background. Uh, we've talked about this before. Everything that wasn't cool was gay. I didn't have a hard time by preferencing this. This was like the nine. This was the early yeah. '90s, where yeah. this was something that was even said on, on TV and was only yeah. challenged within the last 20 yeah. years. Yeah, uh, and you know, and I really didn't have a problem with using inflammatory remarks, particularly at at males or, or gay males, or 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 trying to demasculate a friend by, uh, you know, um, you know, making him gay with with your comments. But it, it was never an article that I read. It was never a study. It was never uh, philosophy. It was never engaging in my faith and the way it was intended to be a loving uh, and accepting place. It, it, was, was, it was probably a human it experience. Was yeah. It was a human. It yeah. was absolutely a thousand percent human experiences and the experience as as we know as educators, as as being caring and trusting adults mm -hmm. for young people whom are different. Mm -hmm. That changed my head and, and my heart. So the value in regard to diversity, equity, and inclusion. We'll get into many different things, including yeah, culturally responsive curriculum 
and 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 how we um, just culturally engage in the learning process with kids. But at this point in time, we're talking about people, folks. I don't know what neighborhoods you live in, or or how how you how you do your neighborhood, how you purchase your home, how, how you do your neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, but you your, know your neighborhood. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it, it is though. You know, I, you know, my wife and I purchased a home in a in a neighborhood. Be, uh, for socioeconomic reasons, but by doing that, by getting our our kids into quote unquote better schools, we really, really you decrease their exposure that. to diverse perspectives. Very, yeah. very much yeah. uh, so. And so the point is, is that the, what I can hope for out of our school is that they are putting uh, coaches and teachers and social workers and counselors and custodians and mentors and interventionists right. that are different than me because I I know our values, my children know where they're from, and they're not going to know where they're going mm -hmm. if they don't have other shepherds. Yep, absolutely. It, um, it, it, what you said reminds me of a quote by Mark Twain, mm -hmm. and I think you've heard me say this quote mm -hmm. before. Mark Twain says, it's a, it's a much longer quote, but the, the first couple lines of it are, travel is the death of prejudice. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm not advocating everybody go out and buy a $2,000 plane ticket because that's how much they cost right now, apparently. <laughs> um, but what, what, the, what the heart of that quote to me has always meant is that exposure to diverse backgrounds, diverse perspectives, different perspectives, um, challenge your own internal beliefs, cause you to open up your own lens, yeah. take additional perspectives. And even though you might not always agree with them, be able to quote, as, as you always yeah. say, put yourself in somebody else's shoes. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the other thing we talk about uh, it, within research, and, and this research has been around since the early 90s, um, but is relevant in a classroom setting, is what's called cognitive elaboration. And mm -hmm. I think I talked about this before. But the idea that putting yourself around people of differing opinions, backgrounds, diverse cultures, backgrounds, um, you're more likely to, uh, the research has shown radically, innovate mm -hmm. um, to come up with and be more effective in your in your idea of creation formation and implementation um, and come up with diverse different ways to solve problems yeah. and, and that's because you're hearing uh, 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 the different opinions different backgrounds um, different ideas that you might not otherwise hear in a more homogenous group yeah yeah and what is what is a classroom other than a highly diverse place for a cognitive elaboration? yeah absolutely i think we got an episode right there on that comment i don't want to dismiss your comment at all but i do want to challenge us to really yeah. examine what is the value of diversity and but i i just absolutely want to underscore that for sure is that we talked a lot about with the young uh, men and women that I got to teach for 11 years uh, under that ethnic studies course I was talking about. Like, why do we want this? Mm -hmm. Like, why did you, did you take this course so that you could be heard? Did you take this course because there's a hidden curriculum and you wanted that exposed? I think those are, those are things that happen. But I do think that what the real value was is when we got into service learning or took on projects or examined our school or examined our community, that there was nothing important we could do if we weren't bringing diverse minds and experiences uh, to the table. Mm -hmm. uh, and in 100 percent, what this is opinion, of course. I don't yeah. know, man. That's why I use percentages because I make them up. Yeah. Like, I literally do. But what's but, the saying? Stats don't lie, but liars use statistics. Yes, yeah. yes, and that's me right now at this point <laughs> in time. But I'm not. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to say it. Yeah. You know, we. You know, we talk about Finland and Scandinavia and some of these other places with these really cool schools and things that are that are moving and shaking. But uh, you know, when a, when a young woman gets uh, uh, killed in the hands of of the Persian uh, Persian government by not wearing her her hijab. There's, mm -hmm. there's, there's a country uh, that cares about what's going on in the world, and that's the United States. There's something about how we gather here in this nation of immigrants that is connected to innovation. Mm -hmm. um, even though we're, we get into cultural stalemates and, and cultural problems, at some point in time, uh, someone is going to emerge within our country that represents a thought process or a point of view. Uh, that hasn't even been thought of. That's before. that's novel, but relevant. Yeah, yeah. and so we we do want um, we do want new ideas at the table. All, we yeah. want all ideas at the table. Actually, if we're going to be at the table, we're going to use that analogy. We want them all there. Mm -hmm. and, and also coming from the place where we know we do not have, we are not the authority on this topic. And if anything, we're really just uh, elevating the discussion for the people who are the experts yeah. on this, and, and that we're lending. Um, weight and credibility that this this conversation is necessary. Yeah. It's necessary in the world of public education. It's necessary in our greater society. Um, but it's how you create high functioning, meaningful organizations. And in this case, a high functioning, meaningful organization is educating our children. Yeah. 
And, and so by focusing on relevant um, practices that are actionable to increase uh, uh, representation amongst our staff and our recruiting processes, our retention processes, our training processes, um, but also in the ways in which we actually uh, uh, talk about this in public with, with children yeah. um, is, is significant as well because when we don't, we undermine the value of that diversity in American society and in the classroom. Let me ask you a tough question, Marcus. Go for it. Let's just, let's just say the whole world... I'm not world... necessarily prepared to answer it. But <laughs> yeah, no, go ahead. But it, you and I know that right now we have a billion viewers, and so the whole, nearly the whole world is listening yeah, to Yeah, we've actually podcast. crashed all the servers on the <laughs> western coast of the United States. No, uh, but, uh, imagine that, that our podcast is being translated in the, into every language, was reaching every corner even of just the United States and those who care about mm-hmm. schools, which is, uh, I am yet to find uh, an American who doesn't care about schools, doesn't have an opinion about schools. Yeah, Marcus, just uh, just to challenge you right now at this time, I'm sitting here, as, and as you know, just so passionate and committed to this, but what our audience is out there. Imagine that our audience is, <clears throat> is truly the whole world. The question is... <laughs> Uh, who's who's out there rolling their eyes? Who who out there right now is saying what either what kind of person or what specific person is like, guys, you're not qualified to talk about this. Mm. You're not helping out. Or I see that you have a golden heart about this, but you're just so far off. You know, why is this so tough? Um, sure. So I think at this point in this episode, probably most everybody's rolling their eyes at us <laughs> for a variety of reasons. Um, and, and I actually kind of mean that. Mm-hmm. Um, one is that, you know, by no means are we... Uh, the definition of DEI warriors. Um, We are not the people with these lived experiences, Mm -hmm. um, regardless of kind of how we we culturally define that in America or how you define that globally. Um, That being said, for for that subset of folks who are rolling their eyes at two middle-aged white men trying to uh, pontificate on this, I I would agree with you. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we don't have those lived experiences. Um, We have not been in a place of marginalization, oppression, um, the systemic processes that that prevent us from advancing ourselves or our families. So absolutely, I, I 100% agree with that. Um, that being said, for that subset that's rolling their eyes, what I would say is that um, it, this is a conversation, like I said, is necessary in, in public education in America, is necessary uh, societally. Um, and because of that, because it's, it's necessary, and I think we both believe that deep down in our hearts, it, it we are pe- we are just more people who are adding to the dialogue about its necessity. Yeah. And so the more people who are speaking out and allowing and providing platforms for others with those lived experiences to then take the wheel, um, I, I think that's why this is relevant. So uh, I would say I'm not coming to you, Brett's not coming to you, everybody at home and listening um, as as 100% experts on this, on this area of this field, but just as experienced public educators who understand and appreciate the necessity of this dialogue – if we're going to continue to advance our public education experience for all children. Yeah, and as, as usual, I'll just, I'll just say it. If you are rolling your eyes, uh, if you are listening, if you are wondering, like, what are these guys trying to accomplish, or do these guys really think they're making a difference, or just as a couple, this is what we really need, a couple more, uh, you know, white guys, Dr. Motor Chandler, and, and who this uh, other... Uh, yeah, my name group. might as well be Chad. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And but my my point though is is like if it bothers you, uh, there's got to be something to do about mm-hmm. it. Whether it's 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 your your church group or or the community you meet with at the YMCA or you know whatever your um, proverbial um, uh, coffee shop is or, or or whatever wherever it is that you meet the people that feel underserved. There's got to be somebody at the very least like you and I who have an open enough mind to say, hey, can I get a meeting? I'd like to sit down and talk with you about this. Your guys is because uh, I do, because I don't get it and I want to. Yeah. 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 And and hey, hey, this is what a school could look like if we had this program or even uh, bring a problem to the table. But in, in, until more people um, who are affected say that there is a problem and at least present a call to action there's very little incentive for us to do anything besides be big-hearted people absolutely uh so the uh, you there was a second part of that question and i've already forgotten it mm-hmm. uh what, what, there was the second part of the question I, I guess it was just what why is oh, it so the other the other yeah. okay yeah. the other yeah. I, I i talked about one subset of people yeah. who may be rolling their eyes yeah. at us um the other subset uh that may be rolling their eyes at us is the subset that um is just saying this is not an important 
this is not an important topic in yeah. American culture right now. Yeah. Um, or, being too PC. Or, or, yeah. or this is this is too PC yeah. or quote, this is only creating more division in an American society. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're kind of looking at two different sides of the, the spectrum here that are rolling their eyes at us in unison. Probably the first time they've all agreed on something <laughs> and that they're rolling their eyes at us. Um, and, and so this is something I, I tell the group I teach. I teach a, a relatively homogenous group of career military non-commissioned officers um, that is historically not, inc it's diverse, but not not incredibly diverse. Yeah, not um, excluded from the institutions, clearly. Yeah, and so I, I, preface, I, I preface my class um, with a challenge to my students. So one, the goal in understanding that uh, marginalization and the role in which power is used to oppress others is not uniquely American. This exists in some fashion or form in, in almost all cultures, societies across the world. Um, the way in which diversity is oppressed or, or marginalized looks different, obviously. Like one religion may oppress another religion, one race another, things like that. So starting there, understanding that this is this is something that, that we know to exist in, across cultures in different ways. But I challenge them with, if, you, if something we've said to you today, if you're in the subset that doesn't necessarily believe that diversity, equity, inclusion is a necessary conversation in American society, um, or that it's creating more division, my challenge to my students is always, um, if, you, if that resonates with you, or you have a reaction to something that's been said, or some data that's been presented, um, you are 100% well within your right to have an emotional reaction to that from your own personal background and experiences. That's a basic cognitive bias we're all guilty of. Um, but examine the root of where that came from. So before we react, or before we say yes it's good, or no it's bad, um, black and white thinking, ask yourself, why, where's this reaction coming from? Mm -hmm. And is this reaction coming from a limited life experience, a lack of a life experience? Um, is it coming from something that's been, happened to me or, or a loved one? Um, and really examine kind of where that reaction is coming from. Um, and I think inevitably, when you start to examine the root cause of a reaction, you're going to start to feel that um, maybe it's a bigger, more global conversation than what your initial uh, yeah. emotional reaction tells you it is. Yeah, especially if in your life experience, you've experienced what you would call reverse di discrimination. You've been bypassed for a position. You have uh, feel like you've earned something by mirror. You feel like you're more qualified, but we're trying to create uh, more diverse workplaces and institutions, and you feel like you've been bypassed by those things. It, if that is true, and I, and I would certainly say that, that I haven't ever seen uh, a policy that has been geared towards uh, creating a, a better, more peaceful society, just being like a straight line down the road working for, for everybody. I'd say even there to get, get on there and write us and, and, and tell, tell your stories. R reach out and, and, and challenge the thinking because at the very least, the fact that diversity, equity, and inclusion exists as an academic term in higher ed, and the very fact that you're working on it with um, non-commissioned officers means it's here, and so you better you better like uh, you know weigh in. And, and so to kind of close out this episode, Brett, um, we've talked about this. This is something that we're devoted to having as an ongoing episode. Um, so you're you're going to see us sporadically over the next couple seasons bring this up. Um, but we really need your feedback, thoughts, opinions. Um, on, on how to move through this subject. What's happening in your schools? What are you seeing? What's working? What's not working um, in regard to uh, uh, hiring, onboarding, training, retention, in regard to what's happening in your classrooms? Um, we're really curious. So as always, um, send us your thoughts, comments, feedback. Tell us why we're idiots. Tell us why you're rolling your eyes at us. Um, tell us maybe what you agree with or maybe a different lens. Send us your thoughts at schoolhousecracked at gmail.com. As always, be sure to like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and download us on all your favorite podcast channels. Yeah, look after each other. Take care and have a great day. Yep, and as always, Brett, thank you for being an advocate mm -hmm. for those that are in our schools, that work within our schools, and the children of our community. Yeah, I'm back at you, Dr. Motor Channel. Thank you for doing uh, making connections with people that are going to lead. All right. We'll see you again next time on Schoolhouse Cracked.